Hello, so in this video I'm going to talk through right realist and new right explanations of crime. Um, so this is just a revision video just covering the, the key content, the key studies and the key concepts for uh, these different perspectives. So before we get started into this, it's really important that we think about definitions here and this was something that was in an examiner's report from the OCR A level so even if you're not studying OCR um, if you're doing it from a different exam board I think it's in, it's an important point and what this basically says is that sometimes right realism and the new right are kind of used interchangeably but what this examiner's report said is that, that you shouldn't do that and it's basically saying that you need to distinguish between the new right being mainly Charles Murray and right realist, which is Wilson and Kelling. Um, so that's what I'm going to do in this video. So try and remember that the new right is Murray, uh, Murray and Herrenstein, and um, right realist is Wilson and Kelling. Okay, so on to the new right. Um so the the main uh, sociologist here is Charles Murray, and this some of this stuff is is obviously controversial, and I'm just kind of running through it, um, and I'm going to do evaluation. So Murray talks about the underclass and argues that uh, because of inadequate socialization, some people from the young uh, the underclass can develop a culture which is characterized by dependency, a lack of discipline, and criminality. Uh, Murray goes on to argue that an over generous welfare state the kind of government handouts create a culture of dependency. So people are kind of wanting more, that welfare actually doesn't help. Also criticizes kind of single parent families, argues in favor of a nuclear family, saying that young people, particularly young men without father figures, are more likely to be involved in crime. So obviously this has been evaluated greatly um, and, and widely, widely condemned. Um, some people said, well, you know, there isn't really an underclass. This, this, it's not kind of substantive. There's not evidence that there is an actual a class of people that you could say are the underclass that are kind of welfare dependent, don't want to work, criminal. You know, that's just you know mischaracterization. Um, also, a, a significant criticism is that countries with more welfare, so if you think about Scandinavia, for example, actually have lower crime rates than countries with with less welfare. So um, if you think of the USA has less welfare than Scandinavia, the USA has higher crime rates. So that Murray's argument doesn't really stand up. Also, some sociologists have said that there's a real lack of evidence linking single parenthood, people from single parent families and uh, criminality. So that's not supported by the evidence. So that's the first work by Murray on the underclass. The next work by Murray, um, and this is, uh, I'll just change that, sorry, there we go. So is the bell curve. And this is, this again is, is quite controversial. So Murray and Herrnstein argues that IQ is a significant predictor in criminality um, and, and really says that IQ can explain class positions uh, and and kind of life outcomes this is really really controversial and widely criticized um people have criticized the methodology they've criticized the use of iq as a means of assessing intelligence you know just just saying that everything is based on intelligence people people have been quite critical of that also i think something from a sociological point of view it doesn't really engage with kind of what about crimes by the people that Herrnstein and Murray called the cognitive elite, people who are got high IQ. They still commit crimes, corporate crimes, white collar crimes, fraud, embezzlement, those kind of things. Um, it you know so if they've got high IQs, why are they then committing crimes? It doesn't really kind of explain that. Obviously, as well, this doesn't explain kind of structural causes of inequality, which might lead people to crime, uh, crime, lack of opportunity, educational outcomes, poverty, those things. It's really just saying it's just about IQ, which is quite a kind of you know single single minded one one you know singular explanation for something that could potentially be you know very complicated so that's that's a very controversial one but it is on the sociology uh specifications okay so now we go on to write um realism now 
And right realism, the main proponent of right realism is James Q. Wilson. And Wilson's first work was this, this work here in 1975, Thinking About Crime. And this work focuses on predatory street crime. And really, the thing about Wilson, overall, what, what the argument is, that is that crime is, a, is based on rational calculations. So it's really focusing on the individual and saying that, People, the individuals who commit crime, commit crime when they think that the benefits of committing that crime outweigh the costs. So the answer, therefore, is about creating a culture of order and acceptable behaviour to kind of influence people not to commit crime. So something, you know, to think about with this in terms of evaluation is who decides what is acceptable behaviour? And I think people, you know, Marxists, for example... Or, or feminists even, kind of conflict theory, might say, well, hold on, who is deciding what is acceptable behaviour? You know, Marxists might say it's it's the kind of ruling elite are deciding what's acceptable behaviour, and that would therefore limit kind of political opposition. Um, feminists would say, you know, let's think about the patriarchy. So if we're saying, you know, we need to create a culture of acceptable behaviour, a culture of order, let's think about who's deciding that. Also, this, as, as it says, you know, focuses on street crime. What about other crimes? Um, white collar crime, corporate crime. The next work is a kind of real classic, significant um, study, Broken Windows, Wilson and Kelling, which was originally uh, um, an article in the Atlantic magazine. And this is the idea that um, if, you know, again, crime is, is a rational choice and it's about the kind of environmental situation. So if there is a broken window, if, if criminals see a broken window, if they see that an area is run down, they are likely to commit crime in that area. So it's um, it's influenced by kind of Zimbardo and kind of psychological experiments. And so what it's about is to, it's stopping areas tipping into crime. So cleaning them up, uh, addressing kind of low level street crime to reduce uh, worse crimes from happening. So when I think about this, I think you know, I often think about kind of the functionalist idea of a value consensus that you could talk about the last one as well um, that I talked about Wilson's work, that it's linked to this idea of a value con value consensus. And this this idea of broken windows really influences zero tolerant, uh, tolerance policing, which has been carried out in the USA and the UK and elsewhere. So clamping down on, on low level crime to stop more significant crime and this happened in in new york city um in the 1980s and 90s and rudy giuliani who was the mayor of new york was a big fan of this kind of zero tolerance policing broken windows where they on the subway in new york for example they cleaned the graffiti immediately so it didn't look kind of run down and this this was an explanation given for the reduction of crime there however you know people have criticized this and said you know this is the underlying assumption here is that police are going to, um, you know, maintain the kind of social order in a kind of fair way. What what about other concerns about policing? Think about who they're going to target. Think about um, who might be unfairly, you know, over policed. Um, and, and again, it only focuses on street crime. What about other crimes? What about crimes that are kind of hidden domestic crime? green crime, global crime, um, white collar crime, corporate crime. It, it's really focusing on on street crime and particularly kind of Marxist sociologists or feminist sociologists might say there are there's lots of other crime going on that, that this isn't really engaging with. And then the last one is uh, again, right realism, and this is Wilson and Hernstein. So this is actually quite similar to the bell curve, actually, Hernstein again here. Um, and again, it focuses on a biological element to criminality, that some are born with a predisposition to crime. This is almost going all the way back to kind of Victorian criminology, where there was this idea of the criminal type. Um, and, and what they argue in this work, Crime and Human Nature, is that in a tight nuclear family, criminal tendencies might be suppressed. So again, it links to kind of Murray's idea about, about kind of single-parent families and things. Again, it's focusing on the individual so a criticism of this, and obviously this has been, again, widely kind of criticised, is that it ignores the kind of structural causes of crime. What about poverty? What about inequality? What about lack of educational opportunity and things like that? So I hope that was useful in terms of running through um, the new right and right realist explanations of crime. If you have any questions, um, please leave a comment. 
below. Thank you so much for listening.